Thank you for watching Truth and Justice with Vivian King. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about the juvenile justice system from juveniles to the adult system and how that works with Damian Walker. Damian told his story about a month ago. It was such a great story that, uh, and such a long lengthy story and he's got so smart and so educated the 17 years he spent in prison that uh, one hour of story just wasn't enough. So we asked Damian to come back. Uh, talk about his experience again. For those of you who didn't hear him the first time, he'll explain his journey as a 16-year-old certified as an adult to do prison time with grown men for 17 years. He spent most of his life in prison. But the good news is he got out in 2010 and uh, has done wonderful things from being a top car salesman to now working with offenders at Sir Jobs to help them get jobs. And uh, I'm real excited for you to come back and I'm real proud of you, Damien. So tell your story again. Tell us how you got certified as an adult when you were only 16 years old. And I think it was you and another young man. Yes, me and uh, uh, D, my friend D. Uh, we've been knowing each other since we were 12. I talked to him yesterday, actually. Oh, wow. And I'm the godfather of his oldest daughter. Okay. Yeah, so that's my, that's my guy. So uh, 16, got arrested. I had um, just been doing not so well, you know, staying in the neighborhood that I stayed in, uh, Southwest Houston, West Airport. And uh, I was in the mix. I was already expelled from school that year. And um, the basic thing that happened is that I went outside on, uh, it was Monday morning, uh, November 1st, 1993. Went outside and some guys were shooting at 9 o'clock in the morning. And uh, my mother told me to stay inside over and over again, but I decided to go outside. So uh, the officers came and they were picking people up. And so the main reason that I got arrested, which we later found out, is that uh, we had on jackets. D and I had on the jackets of some robbers that had jacked some people in the area. So I had on the San Antonio Spurs uh, starter and he had on a white Texas Longhorn starter. Uh, the description of the people that were robbing had on a, a black Raiders starter, which was just like the San Antonio Spurs with the silver letters on the back. And one guy had a Kansas City Chiefs uh, white pullover starter. Oh, wow. So I knew who they were. Um, and we didn't snitch. Uh, neither one of us snitched uh, at 16. He was 15, actually. And he spent 17 years in prison as well. He got out, I think, seven months after I did. So I was 16 and he was 15. And we just went through that process. Uh, went to the county. Um, I ended up signing for uh, five 25-year sentences, run concurrent, so basically 125 years. Um, I wanted to go to trial, but my mother and my grandmother, uh, along with the lawyer, according to what the lawyer was telling us, is that uh, prosecution was ready. Uh, when we got out there, they, there was not there was only one witness there, and she said that I didn't do it when she saw me in the uh, in the jury box. Um, but I didn't know that because it was just like a fall. And this is stories that I heard seven years after I was incarcerated. Um, so I went through that process, certified, um, went to uh, adult court. Um, I signed for the 25-year sentences and went back, to my, uh, went back to my cell and I just was crying. And uh, actually, D had been certified by that time as well. So he was actually in the tank next to, uh, next to me. Um, this was 701 first opened up and when he came to the, he came to the window and uh, we couldn't talk and uh, we just was like signing and I'm in my head of the sign 25 he was like what do you mean I said 25 and when he knew that I had signed for 25 years he just turned around and walked away and because he knew he was next so he had 25 years too he ended up doing uh, he had 25 years sentence too um, and he had a lawyer and I didn't have a lawyer and so what happened was I called my mother. Uh, she was still alive at the time. Uh, he called his mother, and we kind of talked through the phone, even though we were probably two feet, a wall separated us two feet. And uh, we talked to our mothers kind of on the phone, you know, because my mother and his mother knew each other too. And we just talked to each other through the phone, and we ended up going to wreck and talking, you know, and just got my mind right, you know, I'm, I'm going to prison. And so I ended up getting in prison at 17, 1994, uh, October 1st, 1994. Um, I was in TDC uh, at 17, and it was, from that point on, the first day was, was crazy. Just the stories and the, and the, the violence. Uh, I was in the midst of a war. If you've ever heard of uh, the Thongo Blast, like the, the, the Hispanics, they kind of fought 
against uh, Mexican Mafia and Texas Syndicate. Um, that war kind of started at that time. There were a lot of young Hispanics that didn't want to be a part of those big gangs anymore because those big gangs were kind of designed to keep you in prison so they can keep their numbers up. Uh, so the young Hispanics kind of came together and said that we don't want to do this anymore. And they started warring. And for the better part of three years, it was just bloodshed and war. And they were losing at first until they got their numbers up. And then they wanted to separate themselves for protection. But it became a gang. And uh, from my understanding, it's the biggest gang in Texas. And I was... Which one is that? The Thongo Blast. So it was basically being in my city. So you had the Hispanics coming from Austin, uh, Houston, San Antonio, East Texas, West Texas, South Texas. And if you see them, they're the ones that kind of have the stars on their heads, the Astro stars. So it, them, they became one of the biggest gangs in Texas. Wow. Uh, and it started with them trying to fight for their freedom, basically saying that we don't want to be a part of this. But uh, it's difficult. <laughs> I mean, it's difficult to try to do something good and you always got to fight. So you, they had to organize in the only way they probably knew how to organize. Uh, so I was in the midst of that always, just seeing violence, um, a lot of gang activity. And as a kid, going into that situation, uh, I wasn't in the gang, but you, you have to, you, you have to, I don't care what happens, you pretty much have to, you know, be with somebody. Yeah. So we're all going to be together. We're Houston. So we, I mean, Houston rolled together, you know, we strong. And we fought, fought against, you know, Dallas and East Texas and, and, and the Hispanics and the whites. You know, we had situations. So this is stuff that you really have to be a part of in certain senses, depending on where you're at, to kind of survive. So went through that process of the violence and uh, getting my GED when I was 17. Uh, my mother got to see me graduate, though she didn't get to see me get my college, I mean, my um, high school diploma. She saw me get my GED, yeah. uh, which was good. Uh, her and my brother came to, to, to the uh, graduation that I had and just, you know, just kept going. I was fighting my case, as I was saying earlier, and then fighting that case, uh, it, it just takes you someplace because you're against everybody. You think you're against the system. So TDC is a system, too. So you feel that they're against you as well. So as I was talking, um, and it's like you want to continue to war against anybody that you think that's against you. And that becomes a part of who you are on top of being angry about being messed over for myself, on top of uh, signing for uh, some crimes that I didn't do because it was the only option that I felt that I had or I was going to be in prison for 100 plus years. Um, so just... It, it just like it continues to be pain on top of pain and anger on top of anger. And uh, you kind of just don't know how to deal with it. You're a kid, like nobody has prepared you for this. Uh, you don't know what emotions really are. You just know that you act out or when your newfound friends who y'all are all together to basically protect each other, uh, whenever they act out, I'm prepared to act out too. That's what we're gonna do. We, <laughs> if you act out, I'm acting out too. And nothing else needs to be said. I want you to know that I'm gonna go as far as the next person gonna go. So we're going as, as much violence that needs to happen. That's what needs to happen for us to survive. It's not about like, we have to make a statement. Um, and I was lucky to, to, I was in it, but at one point for whatever reason, I always say that God kind of protected me because I never was in too bad of a situation where I didn't come out of. And that was a, some situations that I should have never came out of. Uh, but I'm thankful for that. End up uh, getting to a prison where uh, I got in college, I think I was 19, um, after coming off uh, a, a real bad prison. I got in college and from being in high school to getting a GED to going to college, it was one of those situations where I was lost. I'm fighting my case because I'm innocent, so I had made it to the Fifth Circuit. Um, now, how did you make it to the Fifth Circuit? Talk to me about that. Did you have a lawyer helping you? I know that you had a court-appointed lawyer for an appeal, probably. No, it was the guys that were in prison. We called them, uh, we always called them back then, it was Johnny Cochran. We always called them like the, the prison lawyers. So they would actually go to what we called the law library and they would be in those books. And I mean, you can, and filing rid of habeas corpus. I mean, so I'm learning the terms and we're going through this. Uh, and you paint them. You paint them in coffee, you paint them in soups. Uh, depending on what happened, you can put money on their books. You can tell your family, look, put money on this guy's books. And they are working, they're learning, they, they're learning the system. So you have a law library and you, uh, you set up appointments to go to the law library. So you're in there and you are working to fight your case. So I got through, through I guess, the, the, the Texas courts. I don't even remember the process, but I got through that process. Um, and then I remember that we were um, mailing back, I was going to say emailing, but we were mailing back and forth to uh, 
to Louisiana to the Fifth Circuit, um, and it got denied, which they say it always gets denied. So I had got to that point um, at the Fifth Circuit, and uh, like we kind of talked about beforehand, it was just, it was, it was so much. I was so bitter. I was so angry, um, and I just didn't. I I couldn't shake it. Like it was heavy. You know, I, I just couldn't shake it. And uh, I saw a guy who was helping me. Um, and when he was helping me, he was like so smart. He went to West Point. He was very intelligent. Now, how did he go from go to West Point to prison? Did you ever understand that? He he told me about his case, and we talked about it all the time. But when I tell you, Miss King, so much of that stuff is falling out of my memory. It's I know crazy. that's right. I remember like the main things. Right, 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 right. No uh, but he was had a degree from University of Houston. He had a degree from Texas uh, Southern University. He, a, he was from West Point. He had another degree from somewhere else. And he would always validate that. He was a veteran, too. So, but he always had his documents. He was one of those guys. So if he told you, he actually did it. So he would show you because he wanted you to believe him so we can get that trust issue out the way. Um, so he did that. And um, he, was, he, who, he is who I would have become. Uh, I was already bitter, um, but I wasn't lost. I wasn't delusional. And he became delusional. And I saw a lot of delusion over those years. So when I saw him, and I was with him every single day for hours on hours, and when I saw that he became delusional saying that certain people were after him, which I knew it wasn't true, um, and he literally lost it. He literally lost it, and that frightened me. That frightened me. And I was like, I, I was can't Was he young like you? Or was, well, he, he was a little bit older. Yeah, he was a little bit older. He's like three college. years older than me. Because at this time, I'm like 22, maybe. I'm like 21, 22, maybe. Uh, so he was like 26, I think he was. But did you get the feeling that he was railroaded or that he had done it? From him, um, and according to his case, it seemed like he was railroaded, or maybe it wasn't ex as extensive as uh, the punishment that he got. Um, but that was what he was kind of feeling like. He, it wasn't extensive, so he used to fight hard. <laughs> and anybody that fights hard, you gotta have to say, okay, something's going on. It's some sort of belief. Why is this guy fighting so hard? Right. Yeah, so he fought extremely hard. Um, and he fought those that, that weren't even against him. Like, if he thought that you were coming against him, like he would do, you know, he would fight against that. So I was like, I don't want to become that person. So I, I dropped everything. Uh, I had all my documents. I had letters. I had all type of records. I, I had, they used to call me paperwork at one time. Because <laughs> I had a lot of paperwork, um, one guy. And I sent everything home. I actually, and that was my decision. That probably was my first grown up decision in my life as a man at that particular point to say, I'm gonna commit to changing my route and becoming the best person I can become. Cause I, didn't, I couldn't say I become a better me because I had never been like a, a standard. But that was like me saying, I wanna become the best person that I can while I have this opportunity. And I saw him, cause he got locked up, what you call, like he went to say, and we were at a real easy prison. Um, why would he go to say Because he did, he lashed out against somebody who wasn't even against him. And that's why I said I was making those decisions too, because I know that this person is not against you. I've seen how they've assisted you. And uh, when he lashed out against the person, and um, I just like, I can't do it. And when I, the last time I saw him, um, the look in his eyes and how he had just kind of let everything go, and it was a mental thing, I, I think at this time, and I just said no, and I kind of dropped it. The, the question that I have for you, Damon, is um, while you was in there mm -hmm. and you were seeing what was going on with your buddy that had all these credentials from college, uh, was there ever a time that you was able to look and see how the different guards or the warden, did they kind of look at, when they call you paperwork, did they kind of observe you from the standpoint of, or did you see you or some of your peers in there being observed? like? Why is Damien fighting so hard, but the other guys not even in the law library, they're not even fighting? Was it, was it some other folks that was, um, you know, claiming innocence such as yourself around that time that was fighting just Yes, hard? yes, yes. Uh, and, and, and with that, it's just because people have opportunities because somebody may be fighting for a time cut. So there's different reasons that you're going to be fighting. You may have gotten 25 years, but you only feel like you deserve 10. Yeah. So you're going to fight for a time cut. So you are guilty, but you're fighting uh, for whatever you believe in. So that's kind of the thing. So you may believe in something, and that's what you're fighting for. Yeah. So I believe that I was innocent on four of the crimes and, and not on all five. And if I would have just got convicted of one crime, and no way that I probably would have even got certified. So what... So, what, what, what what, from your mind frame, what was the one that you felt that you was 
guilty of that in, when you knew you was innocent? Oh, I shot a house up. So a guy uh, jumped on my brother. Yeah. And uh, I shot the house up. I mean, it just so many people ended up being around at one time, and there was a a tech nine next to me, and the guy was talking, and the mother was talking, and. Uh, I just heard that this guy saying that I, he jumped on my brother yeah. and the guy next to me had the gun. And in my head, I was thinking, I'm 16, in the head, I'm thinking like, why are you not shooting? And so I grabbed a gun and I started shooting yeah. uh, because my brother and I, we had been through so much. My brother's incarcerated right now on a, a murder case. Yeah. Uh, my brother and I had been through so much um, through our young life. He was He's four years young, younger than me. Um, at eight years old, I cooked for my brother. He was four. I made sure that my brother took a bath. I prepared my brother's meals. I made sure that he cleaned the house up. It, I mean, from eight on seemed like basically. Uh, and then I took care of my brother like a father figure. And my brother to this day, um, incarcerated as he is right now, he looks at me as a father figure to this day. Wow. Um, and when I, after I uh, was arrested at 16, the neighborhood took care of my brother. And that was uh, a, a show of respect for for me, and I guess the work, not even the work that I put in, but who I was as a kid. I was still a respectable yeah. uh, kid in the streets. I actually went by the barbershop today and I talked to the guy that had been cutting my house I was 13. Yeah. So we sat down and talked about old times. But it's just the fact of when you're fighting for something, it's just what you believe in. Like, just like you are, Miss King. Yeah. If you're gonna believe in it, you're gonna go all out for it. Yeah. I mean, that mean, I, cause like, when I was checking your story right last week, and then just hearing you, I mean, you know, when it came mm -hmm. on last month, and then just looking at it right now, a couple of things run through my mind. Number one, how was it that you being so young that you didn't give up on your faith and you didn't give up on God? That's number one. And then number two, how were you able to, you know, channel the bitterness from even the time that you was down there and from the time that you have now come home? How, how were you able to channel that? Because I see so many of the, the, the homies that's coming home now, man, and they they be so mad at the time. They be trying to make up for the time that they lost. Mm -hmm. They come home and they be super bitter that they just want to get back into a life of crime versus trying to make that adjustment to being a, a, a good person and, 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 you know, making all the right moves to be able to stay out here on the free level. So how was you able to, you know, how was you able to make those adjustments? For uh, faith-wise, um, I... I went to church when I was young. I didn't grow up in the church, yeah. but I went to church. So there was a guy, he was a volunteer. So back then uh, at the prison I was at Central, they used to let the volunteer walk around on a Sunday. So he would walk around and uh, he would always come around and me and this guy, um, I always like to tell people nicknames because they don't, they don't actually don't believe it, but the guy name was Whack Whack. Whack Whack. Whack Whack. That was he his was name. a volunteer, not No, no, no. This was a guy, an inmate, that I used to be associated with. So he was probably about two years older than me. He was from Dallas. So he used to be on the formaldehyde uh, up in Dallas. So his name was Whack Whack. And so Whack and I, for whatever reason, we seemed to talk every Sunday around the time that this volunteer walked around. And so when he would walk around, uh, Whack would walk away, and I would stay there and listen to him. So eventually I ended up accepting Christ and going through that process and then becoming a leader of the church down the line and everything else. Yeah. But it was that, it was that, I guess it was the studiousness that comes from my, my grandma, my grandpa, and my daddy and my mother. Um, and that's what helped me because when I, I did accept Christ I, and I didn't go to church because a lot of guys went to church to see the women. Yeah. And so <laughs> I didn't want to do that because I felt it was wrong. Uh -huh. um, so eventually I, I started studying and the guys that were in prison that had grew up in a church that, that actually knew the Bible or the volunteers that knew the Bible. Like, so many people took me under their wing. Michael D. Walt, remember Michael D. Walt? Uh, he talked to me the other day. He was one of the guys when I got to Central Unit. He was a Muslim. I didn't know about Muslim. I didn't know about Christianity. I didn't know nothing. Yeah. Uh, he, we ended up talking the other day, and he was one of the guys that actually got me when I got to Central Unit and said, man, what's wrong with you? <laughs> because I came from a terrible prison to an easy prison, but I still was had a terrible mind frame. Yeah. And so he was like, slow down. And then I eventually like slowed down and it was people like him and other guys um, and in general that they, they kind of like said, man, you can do something else. So it was those, the people that were sowing those seeds into me that was investing in me. Yeah. And though they may not be here now, I mean, it's a, it's a return on their investment. I know they'll be proud of me and I'm thankful for that. Um, my standpoint on as far as uh, kind of writing myself when I was 
when I could have chose to go the other way yeah. was that uh, I always attested it to my to my grandpa um, and my grandma initially because those are the first black people that I saw that that were just king, you know, and queen. My grandma was the first black principal, like we said, on the on the sure, white side of town. Sure, of um, in San Antonio, my grandpa was the first ever ROTC professor at UTSA, Major Marvin Kennedy. Yeah. And uh, his, his stature uh, was amazing. And just being able to see him for a couple years, I stayed with him in first and second grade. And I came from South Oak Cliff, so this time we staying in Dallas. So I came from South Oak Cliff, Prince Hall Apartments, which was notorious. <laughs> Seeing murders at exactly. five, six, seven, right. exactly. So I went there to stay with them uh, and I was the only black kid in the neighborhood. <laughs> and my mother, they were the only black kid in the neighborhood when they grew up, so it's this type of neighborhood. And it was just a, it was just a change. You know, they had a jacuzzi. I didn't even know what a jacuzzi was until I went to their house. So just being able to see them and know who, like my grandpa told me one time, knowing what stock I come from, yeah, that was able to help me when I came to my senses. Um, <laughs> And later on, my I found out which I I haven't don't have a, never had really a relationship with my actual father, um, but found out he's close to a genius. He he was uh, stayed on the streets all the time because he wanted to, because he didn't want anybody to corral him. And I'm that person, but I know that I have to be stable. Yeah. I want to do my own thing. I don't want to be monitored by anything. Um, but my path is different from him. Um, and I always say that when I found out that he played chess. And they say that he was a genius on the chess board. I've never gotten to see him play chess, but I never read a chess book. And at one point, I, I got pretty good just playing chess. So having that connection and finding out many years later that I have a connection with my father, it shows that I have his uh, abilities in me. Mm -hmm. and so the part of coming to my senses was my grandma, grandpa, mother was very intelligent. So just my family. Um, they really inspired me, though they really wasn't there a lot when I grew up, just hearing the stories of who they who they were and what they did. That's so, important. Mm -hmm. So do you ever get a chance to get the, the, the short version, like the billboard version of some of the youngsters that you come in contact with now that you see they're still kind of like moving fast or either really have them just settled all the way in? Do you get a chance to communicate with them and give them a, a snapshot of your, your story so they can that you can kind of reach them and challenge them to let them know that, you know, that, that, that they, they can get it, get it, get it right versus going back and back and forth, back and forth. Do you ever get a chance? To yeah, I talk to whenever I get an opportunity, uh, yeah. whenever I get an opportunity, um, one person um, has asked me to mentor uh, her nephew. Um, a, a big incident happened with him in college, and I've been able to talk to him whenever I can um, yeah. and just meet them on a level. Because one thing that nobody uh, did with me or my guys that I grew up with, nobody ever met us on our level. I can't remember beside a coach. Um, we wanted to be like the, the, at 16, we wanted to be like the 19-year-olds. Yeah. So nobody ever met us on our level. So that's what I try to do. I try to meet them on that level. Uh, if it's, we used to go to talk at Thomas Middle School, or if it's in the neighborhood, if they want me to come to juvenile justice, I mean, to the juvenile center, that's something that I'm willing to do. And also, mainly the guys that's there. Uh, we have a lot of reentry classes, so every class that's... Oh, what is that you said? So at Sarah, where I work at Sarah Jobs. S-E-R. Does it stand for anything? Or it's, just... it's an acronym. It's a Spanish acronym for to be. So Ser is Ser. S-E-R Jobs. That's where he works. Okay. So we have a reentry class. So in that reentry... Well, we have a... Not a reentry class. We have classes that we recruit men and women that have been released within the last three years to come in, like a warehouse forklift class or a construction class or a CDL class. So uh, one one of the trainers actually, when he heard my story, he asked me to come in to the classes that were mainly re-entering. And since then, for the last year, uh, I go and talk to the classes on the first day of class. He wants me always to come on the first day of class um, to just let them understand the opportunity that they have, yeah. but also to make that connection. Because he would always say, he said, yeah, I can see I'm a lily white guy from the suburbs. I'm not able to connect with you guys on the level that y'all may need. I'm here to, to teach y'all, but I want y'all to see what success is. Yeah. And I always appreciate that and thank him for that. So I will go in and actually a guy that I was incarcerated with was in one of the classes. Oh, wow. So I walked in, he was smiling. And mm. most of the guys that I meet in this role that I'm in right now, going in to talk to facilities that I've, and I've met countless guys I've been incarcerated with, they apologize to me. For what? For 
messing up or going back. Oh, because they're going wow. back and forth? Yeah, so because they know at one point I was in the church while I was in, incarcerated. So I was uh, one of the church leaders or I was the president of Toastmasters. So I was in leadership roles there. Mm -hmm. So I was not necessarily over them, but I, I guided them because somebody trusted me to guide them. Mm -hmm. And they apologized. Like, that's respect. the man. Out of respect, they yeah. Salute to yeah. What you, they, they salute to what you stood for and what yeah. you stand for. And they see I'm kind of still on the path. I've messed up, but I haven't went back. <laughs> I'm still scared <laughs> to go back. Uh, yeah. 17 years, that's long enough. Nah, that's, I'm yeah. done. But that's one of the main things. So I would say that uh, just making sure that if, if I'm talking to somebody, uh, to kind of meet them where they're at. You know, Paul said that when I'm a Jew, you know, or, or um, when I'm talking to the Jews, I'm talking to them based on the Jews' mind frame, the Gentiles, uh, same thing. So that's how my approach is. If I'm talking to somebody that's a game banker, I understand that there are certain things that I may not be able to say if I'm talking to somebody that's a hustler. I speak to them in their language. Yeah. Uh, but I never talk down. I'm, I've, I got a degree, I'm at a certain point in life, I'm never going to bring myself down. I'm going to talk to them and do my best to bring them up. And I learned that from, from talking to the guys in prison. That's never it. try to come down, but I'm going to reach you on what level you're on and we're going to work to come up in this conversation. If it's a five minute conversation, you should leave in a better place and I should leave understanding what somebody like you is going through too. Yeah. Wow. So tell me, y'all were talking before we got on air about uh, a prison story, I think. So do you remember what that was? What story was that? <laughs> y'all were talking about something. I said, save it for the air, save it for the air. Not do the guy Bieber, but the guy that went crazy when, when we Well, the white guy that went crazy was one, and then you were just about to ask him. But Okay, so on the guy that went crazy, you said you've seen him since he's been yes, out. Yes, so yes, yes. How is it? So since I've been at this job, um, he walked up to me. When he walked in the room, I was at Bay Area. Um, family, one of the family centers or something. And he walked in the room and was for veterans. So I had just started the job. I was nervous about every event that I went through. They just like, Damon, go to events and pass out flies. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> and so he walked in the room. I saw him when he walked in the room. And uh, I was like, man, there you go. I was excited. And uh, so I let him work his way around the room because he's here for a reason. So I let him work his way around the room. I knew you talking. remember him and his story, but did you remember his face and his name at that time? Yeah, Clarence Bibber. I still remember his name. I still remember his okay. name. Um, and he walked around, so when he got to my table, uh, I was going to be like, hey, you know how you like surprise, like, hey, brother, how you doing? Mm -hmm. uh, he, just, uh, he just started talking about the stuff that was on the table. And I'm like, as much time as we spent together. He acted like y'all had never spent that time? I don't together. think he acted like it. I, I think that it's, it's not there anymore. You think he forgot? It's yeah. Kind of just blanked because out. Because he went crazy. That's mm -hmm. the West Point guy. He went crazy. You think I, it's just blanked out of his it's mind? It's just blanked out because... But did he seem, still seem delusional or did he just see it, seem to be... Because it was like, it was the same thing as far as I got to take care of this task to get to a better place. And that's what like when he was fighting for his case or when you're fighting your case, I got to take to this to get to a better place. And that was it. So this paperwork, um, getting this person out of my way, it, it, it's a mentality uh, that I think that's based in survival. So it seemed like he was still, he hadn't took that breath and said, man, I'm living right now. It was like I'm still based in this survival of fighting the system. So when, he, when you saw him out in the free world at an event, mm -hmm. he was focused on just the task. That was it. He didn't seem like he recognized you? Nah, and I was disappointed. I'm not going to lie. Did you try to remind him of who you I were? I didn't. I didn't because... You just gave him, you just gave him his privacy. Yeah, because I didn't want to... Yeah, because then now I don't want to... You didn't know if you was going to trigger. You probably would have yeah, triggered exactly, something. Yeah, exactly. I didn't want to bring nothing up. So, in, in that sense, I had to think of all that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I had to think of all that. Like, I just don't want to say nothing because I don't know what's going to what's gonna like come that. back. And I saw him twice. I saw him once since then, so he, twice total. he still never recognized him. They'll never recognize him. He really lost his mind. Yeah. If y'all spent yeah. that much time we spend, together. We spent time. We spent time together. Every single day, we spent time together. Wow. It was crazy. We had committed to, if I was to get out, I was going to make sure that I helped him. And he was so intelligent. He got me all the way to the Fifth Circuit. So he was so intelligent. But again, it's just one of those things. I think that was probably, thinking about it now, that was my first brush with, with mental health. Mm -hmm. I think you, that was my first that think, I recognized. Do you think over, over, over the period of time, What's, what, what would be your comparison to the brothers on lot, they come home, and what you know about uh, uh, the, the, the slave mentality? Mm. The, 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 what, you know, yeah, the, the, yeah. What, yeah what, 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 what is your comparison to that? Uh, so it's the institutionalization. Okay. That's a bunch of syllables. <laughs> yeah. So when you, no matter what, that five, six years, you're going to get institutionalized. Yeah. I was institutionalized. For 17 years. Yeah, it's just saying when I came home because there were certain things that I had 
said that I can do, and there were certain things that I didn't know how to do. So my main thing was, was relationships. My relationships was institutionalized because if you cause me issues, you cut off. I don't care who you are. Yeah. If you cause me any issues, woman, anybody, you cut off because I can't deal with the drama that can come with it. Yes. Because in my standpoint, drama is conflict. Yes. In conflict, somebody got to get hurt. Mm -hmm. I don't care if it's feelings or physically, somebody has to get hurt in conflict. So that was my biggest hurdle was the, the relationships. So some guys come out and it's, the, it's how they see themselves uh, kind of adjusting back into society. So you, you are given a time to do everything. And even when you're in prison, if that time is switched up, people lose it. Yeah. Even though you're in prison. So if it's six o'clock, we're supposed to go to recreation and we don't go at six o'clock, people lose it because six o'clock, this is supposed to happen for 15 years. Yeah. For 365 days, for 15 years, uh, multiply that, calculate that. Mm -hmm. So the institutionalization and being able to adjust. So that's the part that people really don't get, it's the adjusting. People come from the military, have the, the PTSD, that's a form of institu inst being institutionalized. Right. People from the streets, or institutionalized people that they, they work at TDC, they, they work for um, certain departments, they're they institutionalized. They mind yeah, to so, a certain degree. so you have to learn how to adjust. And who, who teaches you how to adjust? I don't care about the, the City of Houston Ranching Network program, I don't care about set jobs, I don't care about any other program. Nobody can actually teach you to how to adjust because all these programs are based around a group setting. Mm -hmm. So how can I do this guy who was incarcerated for five years and all he did was fight, 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 and he was at some of the worst prisons for five years, but this guy was incarcerated for 33 years and he was able to do what he wanted to for about 20 of those years because he learned the system. So you got two guys that are institutionalized, but in different ways. Yeah, because I know when I had exited uh, getting stayed home in school, uh, Ms. King, and, and then when I exited uh, December the 22nd, 1983, I was there from October the 10th, 1982 to December mm. the 22nd, 83. Tell them the age you were. I was 13 mm. when I got incarcerated for, you know, uh, firearms, shooting somebody, mm. robbing. And so it's like when I did come home, it wasn't until years later that I found out that the system that I came home to, right. that I came home to, they were saying stuff like, oh, uh, you know, in the last five, uh, maybe in the last 10 years, I found out that they said, oh, when y'all was coming home back in 82 and 83, oh, no, we ain't had no programs available mm -hmm. for y'all. So then a friend of mine that's a millionaire to this day, he called and he's like, man, you a part of a 5%. I, I said, what you mean 5%? He said, 95% of the juveniles that went to TYC back in your era, 95% of them went to prison. Mm -hmm. And so people, would, so when the, the juvenile justice department, TYC, would talk to me, they would say, well, you didn't go, when you left from Fifth Ward with the crime, you didn't come back to Fifth Ward, did you? I was like, yeah. They was like, nah, ain't no way you came back to Fifth Ward. But really, I had, I was doing a lot of crazy stuff when I did come home, mm -hmm. but it's like God just gave me an opportunity. But, I started conditioning my mind that I didn't want to go back in there, no. man. I didn't want to, I wasn't big on talking about all of the fellas and talking about what was going on. You know, I was trying to, you know, condition my mind on what can I do to make sure I don't go back. And eventually, man, I just had a made up mind. I said, man, I don't care how much, I, how broke I'm gonna be, how much I'm gonna have to strive or whatever. I just said, I'm not going back. And so that when I tell my homies now, when they come home, they say, man, that won't nobody hire me. The main thing that I challenge them is, I say, man, don't you know for under $20 you can go and get a DBA? What you like to do? You like to cut yards? You want to do power washing? What up? I challenge them to go start their own business so it can take the fight out of them of having an excuse of going back back and forth to prison, you know? And and so that's what I got a buddy of mine just came home after 21 years. Now he's been gone 22 years, mm. and now he cutting yards. Mm -hmm. But he's so proud. And he'd be exactly. telling about how he cut in the yard. He got, you know, he got his daughter bought him all new lawn equipment and stuff. And so I'm like, man, I'm like, man, I'm, I'm really saluting to what he have going on because he like, man, I ain't going back in there. And I told him, I say, man, at some point in time, you made up in your mind that you're not going back. That's why you running behind these lawnmowers. That's why you you didn't let. Cause he said, man, I went and tried to look for like ten different jobs. Everybody was kind of like breaking his spirit. 
You know what I'm saying? So I be striving to tell, to, to guys, man, find something that you love to do and then go and start your own business, man, because it's, it, it's not design. If you wasn't working for somebody before you left, it's no guarantee that you're going to have that mindset to go work for somebody now. But when you was down there behind the bars, you work for free. Work for free. So you can at least come out here and say, well, man, if I can just make me a hundred dollars a day cutting yards, I know that's I, that's possible. You know, sometimes so, they people can't wait to go to work. And uh, yeah. what you were talking about earlier, I remember was uh, when I came home, like how I was like my approach would like um, kind of like adjusting. And I was I was getting ready to tell you about um, when guy I didn't talk about me being incarcerated. For about five, I never posted anything on social media. So the last prison I was at, we could take pictures and all other stuff. So we had a bunch of pictures because it was a Christian program. We got ready to come on. So we always had events. So if a guy would post a picture of us in those whites, <laughs> I'm calling them. Hey, take that down. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, don't tag me in it. And a lot of times they would take it down because I don't want anybody to prejudge me. Yeah. And still to this day, that was one of my biggest things. Like, I don't want to have to have this hurdle of proving myself when you don't even know me. Yeah. And that was, again, like one of my biggest things. So for years, I didn't talk about it until I started the show at KCOH. Um, I started the show at KCOH with Jerry Beasley, and that's when I started talking about me. Oh, JP. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so JP Beasley. So I started talking about it was with her. Um, we had a show called The Community Voice, and that was the first time. And then I really opened up. I started telling the stories, and uh, when I went, to negotiate a contract with her, I went with, with a rapper, and we were trying to have a show. And I say, I took her some flowers. That's my thing. I'm gonna bring her some flowers. I'm gonna ease the, ease the tension. And I say, uh, I know I'll be working with you, but I want you to understand that I was uh, previously incarcerated. She said, Oh, where my purse at? That was the first thing she said. <laughs> so you know, <laughs> that's JP, did, man. that point on. She uh, probably call you OG this and OG yeah, that. Yeah, she's yeah, something else. She gonna give you the business, it's, man. Exactly. She's something else. So being in those situations, but that was the first time. But then from that, I, I, uh, we had an interview with Kim Burrell. Mm -hmm. So I was able to meet Kim Burrell and a lot of other people. So uh, the incarceration, that stigma that we deal with, that we not gonna oh, it's talk tough, about. Man. It's tough. And that's one of the main things, like how do me, how does Damien deal with stigma? Again, being 16, coming out at 33, knowing the basic stuff, but there are those things that I don't know. And that's okay. what hurts us. Now, 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 that's very key to what you just said, because imagine those five years that you was telling dudes, man, pull that, don't, don't, yeah. don't do that. Until now that you are able to speak on it, do you, what, is your spirit more free now? Yeah. Do you feel a whole lot better now if, if a guy posts up something that same yeah, picture cool. today? You like cool. I posted something. I saw it when we finished. See, yeah, see, yeah. see, see, yeah. and see. That's the Let thing. Make sure I understand. So you people can post things of you incarcerated now. Yeah, because they have pictures. So we had pictures when we were incarcerated from visitation or uh, some event where your family member came in, and so they'll give you that picture, or you can take it, uh, give it to your family. So I have a photo album, and I'll show you when we finish. I have a photo album of when I was in juvenile. I was 16. Oh, wow, I wish yeah. I'd have known that. We could have put it up on the screen yeah. so we and could see, see how and you see, change. And see, that's the real big difference on, of, of what I'm saying. I'm not saying this a, it's a, a modern-day slave mindset, but the one thing that you was kind of running from on not posting is the one thing that have you with a free spirit mm -hmm. and people want to hear your story. It's like, man, we have to... Like, cause people ask me all the time, they say, Art, right, man, there's no way you used to be violent. There's no way you used to be in trouble. And I'm like, cause they see me in today's time, they say, I can't see it. And I'm like, yeah. And so, you know, it's like, if I don't talk, because it's it's a certain group of people. When we was in, in Giddens State School, Giddens is still, it was the worst place you can send a juvenile in the state of I, Texas. Yeah, I know. And it's still, I was almost there. yeah, Giddens was like the top yeah. of the line, but I was the youngest on the whole campus. 13? Yeah. At, yeah. at 13. So it's like, being in Giddens, it's like, man, we fought every day. We had rides. We had to sit down in the cottage and don't go nowhere and, and was on lock. But at the same time, being down there, it was like, it was like a lot of time, it was like blood sport. It was like, this is what we look. It was like, you know, we used to always tell him, he got pressure on you. It was the big thing of pressure, pressure, pressure. So we hit our elbow on the table and it was all about, but you know, it's like the being in Giddens, it was it was so dangerous, and it was folks getting killed in there and stuff like that. Some was awaiting they soon as they turned 18, they was going straight to Ferguson because Ferguson was mm -hmm. the the prison next in line to Giddens. But it's like 
so many different individuals like, say, what, oh, man, man, why you want to fight all the time, man? Coffee and I ran into a house parent probably about six, seven years ago. We was coming from an event in Dallas, and we stopped off and met off the freeway, and she was like, Coffee, your husband used to fight every day. But it was, I was, even though I was one of the youngest there, it's like the whole thing of talking about it now. Someone come in there, Miss King, if they come in there and they ain't walked in my shoes, man, I don't want to hear nothing you got to say. In today's time, I'm speaking and mentoring and talking to different individuals in my hood. And it's like, they, like, man, the art used to be where you going to be going if you don't change them up. I ain't want to hear nothing. I don't, I don't care how many degrees you got. I don't care if you're a scholar in uh, juvenile behavior. Man, if you ain't walked in my shoes, I don't want to hear you. So that's when I knew that if I didn't want to hear from someone who didn't walk in my shoes, that's why I'm so openly, freely to talk about what I've been through back in the day. And by God's grace, I don't have an adult criminal record. I can go work anywhere in the country based upon my 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 my, my uh, adult record. I don't have no criminal record. But nothing. those things are actually... And that's true, but that it's actually kind of good to to have those conversations with people. But like when you're stuck as that kid and you don't have that mind frame, like you you shine it away. You sure right. But yeah. it was a teacher. There was a teacher in uh, juvenile, Donna Ziegler, and uh, she she used to come get me when we had lockdown. So in juvenile, I was on the fourth floor, and you had the fifth no, floor. Ju juvenile on Dallas Street in Houston. Yes. So Donna West Ziegler, Dallas. West Dallas, yeah. Oh yeah, they tearing it down right now. I hear, yeah, I know. Yeah, I just I, passed by the. I I'm like, it, man, they I, destroying when I see the it, I like, I said, man. Yeah, they tearing like, it down. So she would come get me. So she's a teacher, and I'm a, a street kid basically, and she would come and get me out and talk to me if they didn't have enough offices, and we would talk. And so her conversations, though her world was totally different than mine, helped mold my mind or even start that process because I would never talk to a teacher. I would never talk to an educator, even though my grandma was an educator. Mm -hmm. I would never talk to these people. So actually, this is my cute story, I guess. Uh, I wrote mm -hmm. some poems in juvenile, and they put these poems in a book. So I wrote a poem about uh, Christmas, cranberry sauce and all this other stuff, and it was like a big poem inside this book. They published this book. Oh, wow. I had three poems in the book. I wish that I could probably go back and find it. And I used to keep it with me all the time, all throughout the time of me being incarcerated, and it disappeared some sort of way. Uh, but the guy that used to come and teach us poetry in juvenile, and there was a lady that taught us the expressive movements and all this other stuff. And we was in there just doing karate, you know? <laughs> and we were just kids acting bad. But this poetry guy, I was in the county, the same uh, tank right before I got my time. And uh, I got a call to come out to visitation. It's not visitation time. So you know Harris County. Like, I'm like, I don't want to go, because I'm thinking I'm going to be. I'm, so I'm like, are you yeah. sure? Like, it's not time. It's not time. <laughs> no, Nobody's coming, because it's not visitation time. Come out. So I go, and I'm literally walking up and down the stalls, like waiting on a guard to jump out, because I'm about to get whooped. That's all I know I'm about to get whooped. And I haven't I had even did anything. I'm literally just frightened. And so I got uh, to the stall that the guy was in, and the book was, was sitting down, and he was on the other side of the glass. And uh, he brought me the book. He found out where I was, because I had already got certified. So he found out where I was. He brought me the book, and we had a conversation. So it's going back to people like that, uh, people that can, if they're in a situation and they care, because mm -hmm. all we want is really somebody that cares. Now this yeah. guy, because you talked about a woman before, so mm -hmm. is it a guy who was also working at Dallas? So, so Donna Ziegler was the was teacher. a teacher. Mm -hmm. So this guy, I don't remember his name, he was like a volunteer. I see. So on fr I mean, it was a Fridays. Fridays they used to bring the poetry and the expressive dancing lady in. And we would do that. That was crazy. You laugh. Because <laughs> you can imagine a bunch of yeah, roughnecks guys with right aggravated right. crimes <laughs> expressive <laughs> dancing around <laughs> and writing poetry on a Friday. Okay. Uh, so that was just going back to that. But those are when you have people that care and they care just how they can, it does mean something. But just like you're saying, you don't you don't want to talk to those people. But if they continue to come, just like that church guy that walked around after, and I didn't accept Christ the first time, like he just kept walking around like, what's wrong with this guy? And he just kept talking. So it's just like that. So that's who I know that I have to be in a situation like what we're talking about, mentoring or whatever else. Yeah. You have to be consistent. Oh man. If you're not consistent, because people are in and out these people's lives. Yep. 
People are in and out of my life. They've been life. abandoned so many They've times. They've been abandoned so many times. There's so much pain before they get to juvenile, oh, yeah. before they get to TDC. After they get out, they people are mind on everything. It's, there's how can you fix a wound? You got to attend to that wound. You have to attend to that wound. And if you don't attend to the wound, it's going to continue to fester. Somebody's going to pick at it. The situation is going to pick at it, and it's going to continue to, to build. It's not going to scab. Yeah. Then you have to scab. Then you're going to have a scar, of course, but at least that particular thing is healed. And that's the situation with a lot of us that went through what we went through. Like, we were an open wound. We were just an actual open wound. And the juvenile picked at me. <laughs> the TDC picked at me. Uh, getting out, I was on a monitor for two years. But there had to be a time where I had to take certain situations to say, man, I got to heal. And if I don't heal, I won't be able to be in the position that I'm in right now. So Well, we got 10 like minutes, so let's talk about where you are now. Talk okay. about how you overcame when you got out of prison. <laughs> I know you got, out and got married and started selling cars. And, uh, I know what you did. I know you, I know you started off at one little job and moved up to another little job. But talk to us about where you are. You got 10 minutes to talk about the... Sarah Jobs. Yeah, talk about how you, uh, how you overcame the statistics. So I'm at Sarah Jobs right now. I'm a community navigator lead um, over probably the premier workforce development agency in Houston. We provide free career training for veterans, youth, and reentry. Veterans honorably and dishonorably discharged, youth 18 through 24 when school is in, so throughout the school year, uh, and then they're 16 through 24 throughout the summertime. And then reentry, those that were released from TDCJ or state jail within the last three years uh, are those that have been to federal prison, um, so we can serve from 18 to 24. We have different populations that can serve uh, 18 through 24, I mean, or 18 on up. Uh, <clears throat> we have a youth DOL program that serves those that What's have been... That? So youth DOL is a, that's the, that's the grant term, but it's a program that for those that have been touched by the juvenile justice system or the adult justice system that are 18 through 24. So we can provide up to $6,200 uh, in paying for, for them for training that are on a list of high skill, high growth. So welding, CDL training, uh, construction training, they have to get like an NCCR certification. So we can provide, we can pay for training for them if they need a GED. Uh, we can pay for their GED, and they will come to say which our GED program is three days a week. They're in the class, they get a $50 a day stipend, and then $10 a day when they go do the construction work. Uh, and then when they graduate, they graduate with their GED and also their NCCR and OSHA 10 uh, credentials, and it helps them to when they come out, they can go get a training. We all always want to kind of bring them back to say and see if they want to partake in some of the trainings that we have or we can help them with our Workforce Solutions Youth. Uh, one thing with that is that we can provide uh, 300 hours and we can pay them for $10 an hour. So SARE through Workforce Solutions dollars, we would pay them. So we go and find work sites in 13 counties, uh, Houston, Galveston, Fort Bend, and Waller, and all these other counties. So we look for sites, and if the site is a, um, a coffee house, or if that site is a fashion designer, and we have a workforce agreement with them, Sarah would pay $10 an hour, and that employee, that employer doesn't have to pay. Wow. So we help pay through that, through Workforce Solutions Youth. That's a program that they have. But Sarah is a Workforce Solutions office as well. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Reentry veterans is just they open everything. If we can get a veteran in, we're happy uh, because veterans uh, usually get hired pretty fast. They may have some PTSD issues, um, but they or uh, anybody will pretty much hire a veteran. So we invite them to all of our trainings. Uh, so I'm the community navigator lead, um, form partnerships, uh, maintain partnerships, <laughs> work to fill the classes up. And uh, I have a good time. I think I got the best job in here, besides the CEO. <laughs> <laughs> so once they get trained, do y'all help them find jobs also? Because a lot, yes. some of it is on the drive training. That's where you're paying yes. them while they work. Yes, so somebody paid work job. experience. Um, so the goal is we are judged by job placements. The goal is is we sell jobs, but we have an employment services division. So we have uh, four ladies that work in that, and their goal is to go out and canvas the industries and see who's hiring. Now, do you work with the uh, probation department of Harrison? We are establishing relationships. We actually had a big meeting with them. Carlton uh, put us in a big meeting yesterday uh, with that department. I just came from HISD and juvenile um, uh, initiative meeting, I guess you can say, uh, before I came here. So we are working with parole, juvenile probation, um, adult probation. So we're trying, doing our best to work with all the agencies 
So, cause I'm chasing, <laughs> but if I can establish a relationship with the agencies, they can send, they can refer, and we maintain that partnership and we have a, a good communication with them. So that's kind of the goal. But our goal is to make sure that we employ. It's not to fill the classes up, it's to make sure that when they are uh, graduate, that they have a job either to go to or we're gonna help them find that job. So we also do, we're a United Way Thrive Agency. So by doing that, we want to make sure that we um, do financial coaching as well. So they don't have to attend financial coaching, but it's something that's optional. So we always say, if you're making $8 an hour and you go through our training and you get a, a forklift job that pays you $15 an hour, let's talk about asset building. Let's talk about how to repair your credit. Let's go to seeing if you want to acquire a house or whatever else. So let's talk about that. So we also follow uh, up to a year and make sure that, that the clients that we have um, can turn into better citizens too. And we also want to make sure that we can bring their family and friends uh, through the training as well. That sounds like a wonderful program. Yeah. Um, does everyone in your program have to have uh, incarceration or veterans background can it just be regular kids who dropped out of school or yes people who are just having a hard time finding a job yes but most of it sometimes it depends on what the grant is the grant requirements right, right. so if a grant requires reentry we have to use that grant dollars of course for the reentry but we do have other funding sources that we work um, so we can get other people into training as well so they may adjust we had a class that was um, open to everybody, then it'll switch to 18 through 24 year olds. So we gotta change recruiting and go find 18 through 24 year olds. But 18 to 24 year olds who have a criminal record? They have a criminal record or may not even have a criminal record. So it just depends, depends on, on yeah, it just depends. So we, we have a cabling class, MCA Communications. So they basically uh, cable all of HISD buildings and they did NRG. We have a training with them where they uh, pay $11 an hour the day the training starts. It's going to be one week at SARE because we do one week of job readiness teaching you resume, conflict resolution, just making you a better employee because we have employee partners that we're going to refer you to. So we want to make sure that when somebody comes out that they are prepared to work, they have that mentality. And then MCA Cabling would then move to their location and they start training on cabling there. And they pretty much hire everybody because they have so much work. And it's a six-week program. We're actually recruiting for it right now. Um, so it's, it's an excellent program and they really want 18 through 24 year olds because they want people to grow with the company. So this is a relationship with an employer, employer partner that we have that we fostered and we've, I think we've done the better part of eight or nine classes. Oh great. And we send them, then they established another training that they will send their current employees back to SARE and they will certify them in another cabling thing and then they would get those employees back. So they're invested in us and we're invested in them. Wow, That's wow. Mm -hmm. Which program seems to be the most successful? The CDL classes, because I know a lot of people drive trucks yeah. and a lot of people get CDLs while they're in, yeah. in prison, right? Yes, so the CDL class, the cabling class is a popular one. Um, those are the, the two most. Those are the ones with the biggest uh, waiting list. Uh, construction is, in Houston is difficult. Now why to, is that? Because there's a lot of construction going on. But what I learned recently, I had to talk to the um, construction instructor and I didn't understand what the NCCR certification meant. So I had to talk to him and get the, the language. What does it mean? And so the basic language is you have a, sort of a credential that's nationwide, that you can go anywhere without your resume and give them the number for your, 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 your credential and they can see that you have been through this training and you're prepared to work. So that's with OSHA 10 and that's with a couple other things too. So making sure that they have credentials, they can travel, not just for Houston. So initially we're saying come and do construction, but it's come and get this credential that you can add on to if you want to move up into construction because SARE has partnerships with construction companies. So we have this partnership and if you graduate this construction class, we're going to make sure we're going to do our part to make sure that you have opportunity for a career. So it's not just job training, this is career training. So if you want to move up in construction to superintendent and project management and have somebody to invest in you because you invested your time in a free training, that's what Sarah wants to do. How long is the construction class? The construction class is three weeks and right now, and it's two weeks of paid work experience. So you go to class, you do one week of job readiness, then you go to two weeks of learning the tools and learning that, that 
conversation and how to work um, in construction, then you go to a job site for two weeks and you will get paid $10 an hour for this two weeks at one of our employee partners. That's big. Yes. That's, That's a big, big. deal. Mm -hmm. So warehouse forklift, uh, again, um, banking, we have a banking class. So that banking is uh, eight weeks and it's three days a week and it's nine to four. So you learn the aspects of banking from formal bankers. And we have about an 80% placement rate. I think we have one of the number one programs in the nation. It's a nationwide program mm -hmm. and it's a bank works program. And so Bank of America is going to $20 next year, minimum wage. Wow. Oh yeah, so we got an influx. We had, I think, 29 or 30 people in the last class. Well, sometimes you struggle, but when industry changes and it comes across that good morning of America ticker saying $20 for minimum wage, then you start getting a lot of calls. I want to be a banker. I want to, I want to come to the class. Mm -hmm. well, so that's what we got. Are they starting off as tellers or what are they doing at the bank? It, well, for, we train for tellers, bankers. You know, you have to do sales. So you train those aspects of what it is to be a banker, that customer service aspect understanding the communication points of what it is, how you're communicating with your, your employees or, or communicating with your coworkers and also communicating with the community. And the thing about banks is that they want you to work in your neighborhood. So when, a true story, a lady actually drove from South Texas somewhere, I forgot where, but South Texas. McAllen, Harlan, Jim. It was like McAllen, I think it was McAllen. <clears throat> um, Monday, Wednesday and Friday, and she drove up here for the banking class. So we then got her placed in a job in her community. Oh, wow. Um, this was before I got there. This was a story that I heard that, that I always That's a great tell. story. We got 30 seconds. Thank you so much for overcoming. Thank you for telling your story again. I know it's a sacrifice to do that. Um, and I know you've overcome a lot of harshness. I hope people on YouTube will see this, your first show. And then this show, because I'm extremely proud of you. Keep Thank up you. the good work. You're not going sure. back. We're rooting for you. Yeah, see and Art. Uh, what do you want to say? What you been doing? Well, I've been uh, going through the process of um, working on becoming a, a school board trustee for the Houston Independent School right. District for Go. District 2. All right. And so I'm really excited about running for this seat. This is my first time running for a political candidate seat. So I'm, 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 a, I'm an education advocate, so I'm very, very fired up about it. I'm, I'm running around getting signatures between now and be able to turn my uh, 267 signatures in for this Saturday coming up. So I'll be in the streets throughout the whole north side, District 2, uh, just getting these signatures so I can turn it in to the school board this, this weekend. And who has that seat right now? Uh, Ms. Uh, Rhonda Skilling Jones has that seat in District. So you're running against her? Uh, well, her? Is she, she says she's not running, and but I haven't heard anything official. I heard she's supposed to be running for another seat at Houston Community College, but I'm not for sure. But all right, I'm well, fired up. let the best person win. Rhonda is my sorority sister, and I okay. love you too. So uh, I'm, t I'm being told to uh, wrap it up. So thank you for watching Truth and Justice with Vivian King. I hope that we educated you about the criminal justice system and what people go through in Houston, Harris County, and across this country. Good night. Yes.